I should be out there, but it's a little cool. So I was already out. We were out today. So that's why I'm here for a little bit before I um, meet my kids and we all get together again and grill for dinner. But I brought with me uh, Kudos, the third book in this trilogy, and uh, I started it already. And it's eerily similar to, I think, the first one, which one of them is, I think it's the second one though, um, starts on a plane, conversation with a guy. This is the same, there we go, I feel better. Um, this is the same start. She's on a plane, she's going to Europe to talk about her book. Um, and this guy is telling her the story of his life and all kinds of other stories so he can keep awake so he can keep his legs out of the aisle. So I don't, I don't have uh, a lot to say about this yet. It's just him talking. And then because my daughter's here, she uh, brought me The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath, which I may or may not read in December. It depends on how bleak this is. This was gonna be a reread uh, for me, which was, I thought, cool since December has an event going on called Remember December. So we'll see. I'm not sure. I'll dig into that. And then we went to the antiques mall that we go to when we're here and just have a look around. There's all kinds of stalls, all kinds of vendors selling different things, but the vendors aren't necessarily there. They just have a space that they rent and they put their stuff in. And I, in the last two years, I have gotten a book there. I thought I was gonna pick up another Anita Bruckner. They did have one, but I wasn't sure about it. It was one of the later ones. I'll try to remember the name. But instead, I found The Age of Innocence. I have read, did Edith Wharton write Ethan Fromm? I read that book earlier this year and I loved it. I feel like I've read it before, like a long time ago, maybe for school. But I think I have um, The House of Mirth, but I picked this up. Uh, these books cost a little more than The Goodwill, um, but they also, they were 25% off. So it was 25% off of a used book. And um, it says winner of the Pulitzer Prize. That's interesting. I didn't know the Pulitzer Prize went back that far. I'm assuming this was written a long time ago, but anyhow, I'm glad to have this. I've heard a lot about The Age of Innocence and I felt like I was more drawn to reading this one than The House of Mirth right now. So yeah, this was, this was a good find. This was a good find. So that's what I have going on. I'll give you an update when I get further along in kudos probably after the trip. I'll talk to you later. Hello again. Here at the Airbnb, showing you nothing of the outside of this house. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to do that the way this is set up. There's no good place to um, film outside of this Airbnb. Um, but anyway, this is the last day here in Florida. We went miniature golfing yesterday. It was really fun. We had a good day. And where did I get this book? I'm forgetting now. Oh yeah, um, I think I already mentioned that I picked up an Edith Wharton at the Antiques Mall, The Age of Innocence. And you know, I started reading um, Cusk. Um, what's the Cusk I'm reading? Oh my gosh. I have vacation brain fog. The, the last one. I, I just, I don't know. It's weird. I'm not in the mood to read the style that this trilogy is written in, where, you know how it is, Rachel Cusk's approach with these three books is that people are talking to her, and she is very, very little talking to anyone. I mean, she'll say, then I said, or whatever, but it's mainly people talking to her. And 
because this last book starts off very similarly to the way that I think the first one did where she's a stranger is talking to her on a flight. I don't know. I just can't get into it. Um, it just may not be the right time, the right setting. So out of desperation to read something at night for a couple minutes, I started this age of innocence, which I didn't know anything about. And it says it's Edith Wharton's elegant portrait of desire and betrayal in old New York. So this is like in the 1920s or even earlier than that. It's set, this was published in 1921. So this is like early, early, old, wealthy New York. People are going to the opera. It matters who you marry, that kind of thing. Um, and this guy, I guess, is one of the main characters. His name is Newland, Newland Archer's World. Um, the story opens up um, as he's preparing to marry the docile May Welland. Then suddenly, and this has already happened in the first little bit that I've read, then suddenly the mysterious, intensely nonconformist Countess Ellen Olenska returns to New York after a long absence and Newland Archer's world is never the same. I don't know what's gonna happen, but I know that the little that I've met so far of Ellen Olenska, the little that we've been told, I'm on page 42 with my ibuprofen packet as a, as a bookmark. Um, the little we've been told about Ellen Olenska is through conversations that Newland Archer's crowd is having with one another. They're all whispering about Ellen. And I think I just read that she has left a terrible marriage and that she's even moving to get a divorce, which is really odd, but is in the people who are talking to each other, they support such a thing because he was such an ogre or something. But uh, I'm sure we'll learn more about that. Yeah, so I, I like it. I like it. I mean, this is a rare, rarefied air type of world and it is different. I feel like it's different than Trollope's world because it's not as fancy as most of the books that I'm reading in the Barchester Tower series. I mean, sure, there are countesses and so on <clears throat> in the small house at Allington, but not all the books were like that. And um, this, is, this is wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. So I think this is my second Edith Wharton, if in fact, and I forgot to check, if, because she says it's, it's, yeah, I think here it says she's written Ethan Fromm. And, um, and I do have The House of Mirth, but I really wanted to read this one first for some reason. Um, I, I mean, Ethan Fromm is such a classic. It's a very short story. It really packs, it's so different than this also. It, it's talking about a really poor, a really poor family and very isolated and it's such a good story. I, I have to guess I had to read it in school because when I was reading it <clears throat> earlier this year, it just all came back to me. So I highly recommend Ethan Fromm. It's a very wintry tale with lots of, up, with lots of ups and downs and a page turner. So yeah, I'm um, starting this and this is a Collier Books edition, and um, my mom and I were, were noting how heavy it is. I guess it's the paper stock, um, pretty, pretty thick pages, but that's where I'm at. Our flight's been delayed by about an hour and 15 minutes. Hopefully it won't get delayed anymore, and I guess I'll see you back at home. It took you being a roly-poly? Oh, dear the roly-poly. Yeah.
everyone. I'm here with a reading update. So this is <clears throat> Suki's uh, peak playtime right now, right after lunch. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what kind of uh, trouble she gets into. I have Freddy in the back here, uh, an eagle that is now one of her favorite toys. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what we have to uh, entertain her with. You should have seen in a clip right before this the stuff that I've put up on the bay window because uh, we're not putting a uh, a little tree up. We have a pre-lit tree, maybe four feet, three feet tall, with a little base that goes really well in that window, and you can see it from the street. But uh, with Suki and her kitten-like qualities. <laughs> we decided not to. So I have a little tree that goes out by the front door on the porch. And I was putting that together in, uh, I was going to say the lobby, whatever, the foyer. And Suki like jumped into the tree and was climbing it. So that gave me uh, a sign of what might happen if we actually put a tree up. So we'll wait another year. She's only been here for... Um, a year and a half, I think. Something like that. Anyhow, an update on the reading that uh, you've seen me doing in the last few clips. First, I don't know whether I said this or not, but I did, before the trip, I did finish this latest book in the Barsetshire Chronicles um, series called The Small House at Allington, and I have started... The Chronicles of Barset. And this turned out as good as Dr. Thorne, for instance. I, I really like this. It's different. It's different than the other books. The plot, sequence, the tone is different. But it is in keeping with the whole series. I don't want to spoil this at all. But it you'll remember me saying there was a twist. There was a twist in this one. So yeah, that was cool. I tend to slow read these books, so it's, it's just simmering in the background. I pick it up uh, every once in a while at nighttime, and then sometimes if I really get into it, then I start reading it faster or more regularly. All right, so kudos. I took this on our trip to Florida thinking I would get a good part, uh, a good portion of this read because I read a lot of the other book in this series when I was in Colorado. But I just couldn't get into it. I didn't like the beginning at all. It felt too similar to the start of the other book, Transit maybe, where she's talking to somebody on a plane. The person on the plane is talking to her, let's put it that way. And I just wasn't into it. Then at about page 40, I just wanted to see if this was recording. Um, where does it start where she meets someone who's going to interview her or something? And it's around page 50 or so. That person talking to Faye, our main character who doesn't speak a whole lot, other than to say, I asked her this, I said that. We hear the interviewer's story, did they say her name? Maybe not. About how her and her husband are friends with a couple and what happens in that couple's relationship and how it affects their relationship. That's when the real Cusk talent in this trilogy kicks in. That's when I was back into it, like I had been in some of the other dialogues that the other characters in the other books have with Faye, our main character. This is where the beauty of her writing in this trilogy comes in. So I'm really, I'm into it now. I'm, I'm up to, because I'm really liking this, uh, this character in the, in the restaurant, um, this interviewer. So yeah, I'm really into it now. If you start this one and it's a little weird, then stick with it. I can't say how it's all going to turn out after this 
interviewer sec section, but we'll see. It's caught, it's caught my attention for now. The big winner of the trip was the fact that because I wasn't enjoying kudos, I started the book that I bought at that antique mall, which is Edith Wharton's Age of Innocence, The Age of Innocence. I wasn't planning on starting this at all. When I read the back, first of all, the back has too much detail about the story, so don't read the back. Don't read the descriptions of these books. But um, I started to read the first couple pages of the introduction, knowing that I didn't want to read the introduction, but I just wanted to remind myself about Edith Wharton and her wealthy upbringing. Wealthy, but I think like some people of her time, you know, because she was sent to boarding schools and everything, she was terribly lonely. But, um, and, and because of the, the time of history that she was brought up in, parents didn't have a whole lot of you know, emotional connection with their kids. I started reading this and it became a page turner. It has remained a page turner. I'm up to, I mean, yeah, I'm all more than halfway through on, on page 219. And um, what I can say about this is that it won the Pulitzer Prize in 20, 1921. This is wealthy society in New York City. And so we're talking about families, families that some of them have been wealthy for generations. Some are wealthy from their uh, relatives in England. Some are wealthy because mostly because of business um, because of industry and, um, and then some families are simply now wealthy because they married into families. So they aren't born wealthy, but they have become relatives of the wealthy. And, um, the main character's name is Newland Archer. Uh, a lot of the time he's referred to as Archer in the book. He prepares to marry the docile May Welland. So he's marrying into the Welland family, which is going to be good for him. But you come to find out why, why May Welland? Why is he getting married now? Edith Wharton layers in parts and pieces of Archer's uh, young history. I think he's 30 or something and why his mother has said, yeah, I think it's time, I think it's time for you to get married now. Um, so we're given that information a little at a time. I, I really like that way of building the story. And then there is a mysterious and intensely nonconformist cousin that comes back to New York from Europe. She's married somebody in Europe and that hasn't worked out and she's come back to New York thereby leaving him. Her name is Countess Ellen Olenska. So she has married a man named Count Olenska and she's looking to get divorced. She just wants completely rid of this guy. Uh, oh, Newland Archer is uh, an attorney. So maybe he can help her. But it's it's so delightful the way that Edith Wharton is unfolding this story about how Ellen Olenska is turning everybody's lives upside down, but not in the form of formulaic tropes, you know, not in easy scenes. Edith Wharton I feel from the very little that I've read of her is doing this in more complex, nuanced ways. You have to pay attention. I really like that. I realized after I read um, this uh, 
description on the back about uh, about Edith Wharton that she also wrote Edith Fromm, which I read earlier this year. And even though it felt like it was a reread, um, it was um, new again to me because I think I probably read it in school. I have the book called The House of Mirth, and now I'm more interested in reading it. It looked too, it looked too like Gilded Age um, characterizations of people in the Gilded Age for me. I didn't feel like it would have much depth. But now I feel like it could because of the writing in this. So without spoiling it, let me know how you feel about the Age of Innocence. I feel like there's a couple booktubers that I um, watch and that are, I would consider friends of mine that have read and loved this. So I'll be, I'll be waiting to hear who, who they are. Then before I left, I think I talked about in my last video Stoner and that I was going to reread Stoner and I got pretty far. It was getting bleak. Um, yeah, the story can be bleak. It goes up and down. It has a lot of ups and downs. So I'll keep rereading this, but I'm going to pause it until I get done with, um, with this because I just want to be immersed in this world and then I'll come back to Stoner. Before I left, I felt like I had run out of library books that I was interested in reading. So before I left on the trip, I went to my shelves and I, out of, I don't know, nowhere, I picked out from those black spine penguins that I have. Finally, I picked out The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. I thought, is this going to be too, oh, dare I say, twee? Uh, a couple women that decide, married women who are just bored out of their minds and not feeling appreciated. They just decide to rent a house in April for a month. Uh, where are they renting it? Where, where, where? Somewhere warm. Oh, in, in Italy. Uh, Southern Italy. And it says it, it, this book was an immediate bestseller upon its first publication in 1922. Yeah, and this, I thought so. I thought this must have been made into a film and it looks like it has been made into a film in 1992. So, what I'm loving about this book is it doesn't feel twee at all. There is depth and um, a lot of, of good and gritty character development. Sure, these women seem proper on the outside. They're saying all the right things, but you get their thoughts. And that's the really interesting part. Uh, everyone's trying to get along with everyone. There ends up being four women that go to this, it is the Italian Riviera, um, that go to this house that they're renting. Of course, they're doing all of this by letters, but they, um, they, don't, they don't know each other very well. They're all from, they're all different ages. They're all have enough money to rent a house for a month without having to ask their husbands for the money. So that tells you something. But I like how there's alliances between some of the women, some of the days, and then the, that falls apart for another reason. Um, maybe one of them wants their husband to come and you ha you're wondering, is he going to come? How is that going to change things? How does their mind state change even after they've been there a week because they are completely out of their element. They are entirely doing something independent, something they've never done before. This is very unique for this time and in their lives and um, they are feeling uniquely independent and um, 
So I'm loving this. This was also a page turner. Let's see. I have some, I have some, pl some parts. This is very early on. Mrs. Wilkins is one of the characters. No sounds were to be heard in the house. This is in the morning when she's waking up. So she supposed it was very early, yet she felt as if she had slept a long while, so completely rested, so perfectly content. She lay with her arms clasped round her head, thinking how happy she was. Her lips curved upwards in a delighted smile. In bed by herself, adorable condition. She had not been in bed without Mellorish once now for five whole years, and the cool roominess of it, the freedom of one's movements, the sense of reckless, recklessness, of audacity, and giving the blankets a pull if one wanted to, or twitching the pillows more comfortable. It was like the discovery of an entirely new joy. That just gives you a sense of this writing. This writing is not twee. It's not, um, it's like one of those books that opens up and ends up being more real, more gritty than you think. I'm thinking of Mrs. Palfrey at the Claremont, forgetting now who writes that, uh, who writes that book, is it Elizabeth Taylor? That ends up like, oh, a proper older woman goes to this rather shabby retirement place um, what's that going to be like? And then it's something, it's something. All right. It is not, it's not what you expect. So, um, I feel like this has the same sense to it. And the writing is so good. So good. Sharp observations is how I would classify that. My, um, daughter brought me the bell jar we can't decide whether this was originally my copy or not because I don't remember it at all. I'll just read a little bit from the back. Uh, of course, this is a, a book written by Sylvia Plath. The Bell Jar chronicles the crack up of Esther Greenwood, brilliant, beautiful, enormously talented and successful, but slowly going under, maybe for the last time. Sylvia Plath masterfully draws the reader into Esther's breakdown with such intensity that Esther's insanity becomes completely real and even rational, as probable and accessible an experience as going to the movies. So yeah, it'll be interesting to try this out again um, and see how I get on with it now. Then lastly, a nonfiction that I got from the library that I'm dabbling in, I would say. I'm not like seriously reading every single page, but I am chapter hopping uh, this book called Meet Me, Meet Me by the Fountain, an Inside History of the Mall by Alexandra Lang. Alexandra Lang is um, a person who has studied architecture and design, and she's written books and articles like in The New Yorker, for instance, about our use of architecture, uh, cultural trends over the decades, and the mall, which I, I have to imagine is very American in its creation. Um, this is a post-war, post-Second World War creation. I think the first mall was built in the 50s, 1954 or something, in Minnesota or something like that. Um, lots of pictures. This is a, a mall in New Jersey called the American Dream or um, American Dream. You will probably find if you're in the in the United States a mall that you've heard of or maybe even have lived near or gone to because she runs the gamut. There are certainly malls that I've been to in this book. Um, the chapter that uh, I've gotten to is chapter six, which is Dawn of the Dead Mall. And this is about, somewhat about, the era of the 1980s when the movie Dawn of the Dead was filmed in uh, a place that I'm familiar with, which is Pittsburgh's Monroeville Mall. This was, this was filmed when I was still living in this area uh, in 1986, I think, is when it was uh, released. Or no! 
1978 director was George Romero. Um, and it starts to talk about malls that were, of course, still being built at this time. One of them is the very large Owings Mills Mall. But by then, it said that, oh, what, what I really like is that it talks about the original developers of malls, like it goes into who the first group of real estate companies, uh, who they were, and what kind of malls were built uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then how trends changed. By the 80s, this uh, Owings Mill Mall was built, and um, they built it to be, um, this is outside of Baltimore, Maryland, they built it to be more high-end, which was the start of a trend in malls. Like, how was that mall going to be different than other malls? Um, yeah, so that's the chapter I'm on. That's it for me for now. I'll update you again once I've finished these two books, which won't take me that long. And maybe I will dip into this depending on how dark it is. That's going to be the thing. I don't know. And then I'll start with this. So, oh, I wanted to say that Santa Claus that you saw in the clip, the middle Santa Claus that looks like it's plastic because it is plastic is from my childhood. So it's got to be from the 60s and it plugs in. Of course, we don't plug it in anymore because it has its original plug and um, it has a little like you would put a Christmas bulb light in it. One of the original types of Christmas bulb lights that size and um I still have it and I love it. I just adore seeing it every year. My sister and I would have that and then another decoration with a little light bulb in it in our rooms at Christmas time. So it's really um, special to me. I'd love to know your reading experience of any of these authors that I'm talking about, especially Edith Wharton, Elizabeth Von Arnhem. Tell me about any other books of hers that would be interesting for me to get to. And of course, Sylvia Plath. Did she only just write the one fiction? I think so. Um, yeah. Thanks for joining me. Please join in the conversation below. I love, love, love hearing from all of you. Thanks for watching. And I will talk to you later.